Andy here tonight on 0800 TARDIS Live. We'll be joining with the Timeless Child episode. You can sit there and hear about all the spoilers here. We have guest characters both in studio. Elaine Pope, who will be coming here live from Sydney, and William Hannafan coming live from Burbank. So join us ready for tonight for the season finale one hour special of 0800 TARDIS Live. So, what did you think of the timeless child in the episode? Do you feel that there's a lot of unanswered questions from that? I mean, I have to be honest with myself, I had to watch it twice today, because it just seems to be a bit of like a, a jumble, or um, it feels like, you know, the season where we'll meet to sit there and have all the questions answered, we seem to still have a, a couple of bits missing. So let's roll down to the questions of today as what Radio Times would have sat there and asked. So question number one, where does the timeless child fit into the Doctor's Who canon? Question number two, uh, just who was Brendan anyway? Question number three, what redact who redacted the Matrix and why not just redact the whole thing? Where is the Doctor actually from? How many lives has the Doctor had? What is the division? Who is Joe Martin's Doctor and, and does he have a tar uh, was it, does she have a police box TARDIS? Who, what are the Morbius Doctors? Did the Master and the Time Lord Cybermen die? Where did everyone keep getting TARDISes from? How will the Doctor escape from prison? Who are the Shabogan? Shabogan. Shabogan. Yeah, thanks, that character. <laughs> uh, when will the Doctor? When will Doctor Who be back? Uh, and so those are some very big questions to be asked. But, so we'll join our power panel of tonight of guests, so if Carrot can make his way to the nice seat, and then we can sit down there and uh, say hello to our guests, uh, was it Elaine and um, William, who are coming here live uh, from LA and uh, not LA, Burbank and Sydney, better get the right part. How's it going all the way across the world? <laughs> it's cool today, we had a big uh, weather change recently, but it's California, it's always nice. <laughs> yeah, I was just there a few weeks ago as well. Yeah, for Galley. And, and um, how about yourself, Elaine, since uh, you've been a bit quiet there? I've been alright. I'm still at 6pm here, so I've had a long day. But yeah, it's nice. Um, yeah, I definitely hot. It's definitely hot. And how's those bushfires, considering you're from the uh, not-so-lucky country with them at the moment? Have they come a bit more under control? Yeah, they're actually all in the state of New South Wales. I'm not too sure about Victoria. I think it's the same, but yeah, they're basically under the control now, and it's more so the rescue and like um, recovery efforts. Oh, that's good to hear. So let's get back to the fun part of Doctor Who. How did you find the uh, was it Timeless Child? Um, I remember I picked Timeless Child was the latest one, wasn't it? Yeah. So, well, Timeless uh, Children. Children. Yeah. As a child, I've got it wrong. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, lately I did read some comments about it. Like, I didn't really have too, like, you know, too much of an issue with the episodes. Like, I'm a bit behind, so I've been going, you know, back and forth trying to watch all the episodes as I can. But um, it did, I did see a lot of comments that I kind of agreed with where it was like, they're saying it was like retcons because there's a lot of stuff that apparently, I don't know for sure, but in like a lot earlier seasons, they 
basically don't make sense now because of this episode because it's like where's the doctor even from and stuff like that. So it basically threw a bit of a curveball to the whole episode. Well, I, I'm not. Really, I agree it is retconning, but the way retcons work is that they don't actually change what's happened; they just recontextualize it. Everything that happened in the previous show still makes sense. Like this is a. It's obviously kind of a weird change because it changes everything while also changing absolutely nothing. Like everything that happened in the show, like still happened. Like. And also, not to mention, this show's kind of been retconning itself since as early as 1969, so, uh, I'm not really sure that I can take issue with doing it again. Have we forgotten how the doc Eighth Doctor was a half-human? Like yes, actually, yeah, that is right about the half-human, uh, line. Yeah, he uh, was the only one who was half-human, all the others were pure time lord. Like, <laughs> yeah, right, right. yeah, that's my head canon. So, so, William, what's, what would you sit there and say this? Because I thought you said you had, well, um... You know Having not watched, I, I haven't had a chance to watch the new one. I've got it on right now without the audio, just kind of looking at it. But um, a few episodes ago, when they went to the the world uh, that was supposed to be Earth, all destroyed by environmental damage, <clears throat> the doctor said something very interesting. She said, "This is a possible outcome, a possible outcome." So to me. That means that the Joe Martin Doctor and anything that happens with Gallifrey from this point might be possible futures. Not necessarily in the same timeline as the, as the show started in 1963. I think that's kind of a, a way out of it by saying these are possible futures or possible happenings. Um, you know, because they always say that a different universe is created when people choose to go either left or right. So this might be uh, a separate universe or a spin-off universe. So that's an easy way to explain it when the next showrunner comes on, because, you know, well, that was all happening in a different universe, you know. Well, there is a fan theory that ever since the end of Twice Upon a Time, the 13th Doctor has been in an alternate universe, but um, I don't really think this is what's going on. Like, um... Orphan 55, the ending wasn't so much about literal world building as much it was about, it was to give the episode thematic weight. It's like, this is a future, it's like, but it's also about humanity's agency in causing said future to happen. It, it really has like nothing to do with um, like the Timeless Child Arc or the Ruth Doctor or anything. It's like, I mean, my first theory when she turned up was that she was from an aberrant timeline, but um, I'm still not entirely sure what's going on with her though, because... Well, you know, but if the Earth took that route and destroyed itself, then a lot of the future episodes of, you know, future Earth in Classic Who wouldn't have happened. Those, because the Earth wouldn't have been there to, you know, colony in space, which I just watched with John Pertwee. You know, that wouldn't have happened because the Earth would have been destroyed by, you know, and they wouldn't, the third Doctor wouldn't even have met those colonists, you know. Well, yeah, but the way I think that it could, what the key might have been when she said to her companion, "This is a possible future," that maybe we're just dealing with possible timelines, possible things that happen. Maybe, like, um, you know? I think I think we're talking across purposes. Like, I'm talking about um, like themes and interpretation. What a writer is trying to say with the story. I'm less concerned with um, the literal world building going on. That's why I'm pretty sure that Orphan 55 like, has nothing to do with this arc because, like, at a thematic level and character, it, it isn't really set up as one. Like, if there is a point of comparison in universe, it's to the Curse of Fenric, which I think I mentioned. It's like, that also had a dark alternate timeline where humans evolve into vampires over, like, half a million years of industrial progress. But that they also got kind of unwritten, so... Following Orphan 55, they have the Frankenstein episode, which was a retelling of the Doctor meeting Mary Shelley, which he had already done at the Eighth Doctor in the audio adventures, which are con considered to be canon. Oh yeah, I've listened so, to those. Like, I can easily hear canon all that away as, like, the Doctor just arrived on the wrong night. <laughs> A lot of people are talking about multiverses and multi-happening. I'm not necessarily saying the current showrunner is going to say this was all an alternate timeline or alternate universe. 
but it would give the next showrunner an opportunity if they wanted to put things back to the old timeline and kind of retcon all this, which I kind of think may end up happening if the show continues in the night of, you know, for a while. I sort of hope yeah. that they don't because um, I see that this is an interesting change because it doesn't really impact, like, much of the show's history, but, I mean, like... It, it, I mean, like I said, it means everything and nothing, but it does mean interesting things potentially for the Doctor's character going forward. I mean, up till now, the Doctor has been a figure of privilege. They are a Time Lord. They were an aristocrat that kind of turned on their heritage and decided to venture out and help people. But now the Doctor is shown to be something else entirely. They're basically a victim of Gallifreyan exploitation and colonization. That was like... It's, unwillingly assimilated into their culture. That is a very interesting thing that you can do with that. So I kind of hope they don't undo it because, I mean, I at least know friends of mine who are interested to see what they can do with that. Like, I'm not sure this is a thing I would have written, but I don't, I've not just, I wouldn't want to just throw it away. Like, it has potential, I think. So what's your opinion, I, Elaine, I, since you've I, actually been quite... I, I, I'm kind of treating it like this. Uh, you have the reboot of Star Trek. But you have the Mr. Spock from the original Star Trek timeline jump over to one timeline and another and influence things that exist in that timeline. And that's kind of what I'm thinking uh, along the lines of Doctor Who in order to not have to adhere so close to, you know, 50 plus years of continuity. You know, that they, they wanted to loosen that up so they could tell stories their own way. They've always been loose with it. How many times has Atlantis been destroyed again? Yeah, that's true. And so, Lane, like, let's get your point of view, since both you and I have been very quiet <laughs> so far. Sorry. Um, look, I think it's like, I think a lot of things in Doctor Who, I find really hard just to grapple. Like, I'm definitely going to have to watch the episode again. But I feel like with, like, big things like this, I guess I want it to stay the way it is, just because... If you undo something as big as this, I just don't see a point in doing it in the first place, I guess. Um, but, I don't know, is it like, would you call this a fixed point in time, or... No? I don't know. I mean, you can sit there and possibly call it a potential point in time where you can sit there and try and rev uh, where it's the re the point where all points have got to converge, where it could change into completely different infamous sort of um, lines and that sort of thing. So, I mean, that... Because, like, as I sit there and say, this has become quite a setting point in Doctor Who because it's, uh, it's it, it, it kind of explains where there could be multiple versions of the Doctor going out there where, you know, you've got, what was it, there's the Joe version that's out there, there's also the Brendan version which has been, uh, you know, suggested is well, he part of the Doctor Who well, one? Really? Like, I don't know. You I said mean, you watched it twice. Like, it's pretty clear what was going on with Brendan. Like, yeah, it was okay. So when the doc, when the master explains like the whole timeless child thing, yeah. like he tells the story, like um, this woman found the child, adopted her, and then she like fell off a cliff, and that was when they discovered her ability to regenerate. Brendan was just like all of that, but told through the lens of early nineteenth, early twentieth century Ireland to yeah. make it look more innocuous, like. It was a Matrix disguise, really. So Brendan was the Doctor, but, like, not quite, I thought he was like a chameleon arch Doctor. It turns out, no, it was just like a... It was an interpretation of real events. Mm. Yeah. So, <laughs> go on there. So who's next well, uh, jumping in? The divergent timeline thing. I, I think that that's an easy way to explain it, and not affect too many people, where this reality that we're watching now is a reality and the previous continuity is a reality you know divergent timelines that those have never really been explored too much and that could explain a lot of things like for example the multiple atlantic you know different differing timelines doctor who is not a linear show it doesn't happen in in a particular order other than what we see on on uh, screen they put in audio adventures or comic books or books in between those those uh, episodes and such. But, you know, how many timelines are we ever really dealing with Doctor Who? We can't really tell that because it's not a linear storytelling. Yeah, there's a, um, there's a book I recently acquired at Galley. It's written by a man called Paul Mars who has a 
famously hands-off approach towards continuity. But, um, so he has a conversation between the Doctor and this woman called Iris Wildtime, and she's kind of a Time Lord, but not really. Um, and he, she tells him to think back on his past life. And he starts realizing that he's remembering adventures that he didn't have. It's like, he mentions, wait, Nyssa and I, as soon as we left Tegan, we then met her again. But then he starts remembering, no, wait, we actually traveled together for years before we met Tegan again. It's like, he can remember adventures retroactively appearing in his head. And it's like, mm. that seems to be like an explanation for like the expanded universe and stuff. And it's like, I mean, Iris Wildtime is like, she's, um... She's a figure of chaos, more or less benevolent, but she has a decidedly if you attitude towards the rules of reality and causality, and the Doctor kind of does too, but they at least normally try to pay lip service to them, so it results in a bit of conflict between the two. Like, the seventh Doctor and Iris hate each other because he's all about order and control, while she's, <laughs> while she's pure chaos. And speaking of the seventh Doctor, he knew about the Timeless Child. I'm guessing like there was some like quirk when six died that caused seven to remember, and that's why there's all that stuff in like Silver Nemesis about how he's far more than just another Time Lord, and how there's it, something did, way more to did him. Did the Sixth Doctor have access to the Matrix in the Trial of the Time Lord series as well? Yeah, so yeah, but that wasn't really what I was talking about. It was like mm -hmm. um, it's like the Seventh Doctor was the only one who remembered, but because he was such a control freak, he hid the information from his pre from his later selves. But it's like, while I'm on the Seventh Doctor, I kind of have to talk about the Cardinal Master Plan. Because this is what this whole Timeless Child arc is kind of a reference to. So, it started on TV with, um, like, them building up more mystique around the Doctor. And it was supposed to culminate in a story called Lungbarrow, which was eventually published as, like, the penultimate Virgin New Adventures novel. It also cost like a hundred and something US dollars to buy, so even when I was at Galley, I was like, yeah, no, I'm not getting this. But it, in it, it's revealed that the Time Lords are all sterile, and they reproduce through a means of genetic looming. They are all created as cousins within houses, and the Doctor is, was created in the House of Lungbarrow, hence the name. But there's also a big reveal that way back before before they were all rendered sterile by the Sisterhood of Khan. Yeah. Um, there were three big Time Lords. There was Rassilon, and Omega, and another. And yeah, the other yeah. is like, wiped from history, basically. And the idea is that he threw himself into the looms in order to get them going. And the Doctor is in some way a recreation of the other. Like, none of his memories. And... It also has, like, Susan is actually the other's granddaughter, and when he travels back to ancient Gallifrey, she, like, recognises him as her grandfather, mm. even though he doesn't really know who she is. This is a bit like that, only instead of the Doctor being, like, a reincarnation, it's like, actually, no, the Doctor's just, like, existed continuously since, like, the dawn of Gallifrey. Mm. Like, I'm actually looking forward to the next time we bring back Rassilon so the Doctor can just snap, respect your elders. <laughs> <laughs> C certainly. Um, just trying to think of what else. Um, the Cybermen Time Lords. Oh. <laughs> now, you I have loved to them. Yeah. They were ridiculous. I loved them. So, they're just so camp. But they're, um, but they're amazing. It's like, if, if this was a design that in a universe where Doctor Who doesn't exist, like, and they just appeared in some, like, sci-fi movie or TV show or whatever as, like, these evil robot overlords. I think we would call them a great design, but I think it's because, like, they're a mush of Cyberman and Time Lord. They just look silly, but I love them. Like, how often are they treading on each other's capes? <laughs> they have capes! And the content that I... This, I love them! Like, the whole Cyber Master thing that... Honestly, I, I mentioned earlier that I met Matt Fitton at Galley. He actually wrote a story where the Cyberman, where the Master pretends to get converted into a Cyberman, but and calls himself the Cyber Master. So yeah, that was funny. So, like, <laughs> what do you think about the uh, Gallifreyan um, Cy Cyberman? <laughs> It is a bit whack, you know what I mean? Like, it's really odd to 
to um, Death in Heaven from Season 8. Indeed, my, I'm still convinced that this master is pretty messy. I mean, his line about how appealing to my better nature, you know I don't have one. It's like, and, you and, fucking liar. And, and also the one of, I remember when he was a really little, little girl. Oh yeah, Missy Met 13. Yeah. Like, that, I love that. But, yeah, um, and it does, it does. It's just like, because the, the master has the Siberian in his head. And it's presuming it stays there. That would explain how Missy's able to like execute her giant Cyberman plan at like in season eight. But this is my head cannon, and you cannot change it. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I'm I'm just still kind of annoyed that they're ignoring Missy entirely, despite the fact she had like one of the best arcs in this entire show. Which actually makes me think, and I just want to sit there and get opinion here. Does do we think Sasha Dewan's version of the Master, and also for the ones who are following the live stream here? Do you think his master in the timeline is before Missy's version of this? So they're actually slightly out of sync. Yeah, I would think that that would be the case. It's entirely possible that Sasha Gawan's master could be pre-John Sim. Well, I'm pretty sure he... I, my I, personal theory is that... Because I don't detect that maniacal craziness that we got out of John Sim <laughs> in Sasha Gawan. I, I see more of a reflection of Anthony Ailey and Roger Delgado in his in, in what he does. I don't see the you know the the insanity that was passed on from the John Sim master. I don't know. I do. Like um, like my personal theory is that like the Sasha Dewan master was created when John Sim, after he got stabbed, was like because he doesn't want to turn into Missy, and because he was just thinking really really hard, not her, please not her. And so he ended up like that. And that's also why this master is, like, so nihilistic. Like, he doesn't get mind if the Doctor is going to, like, kill him and everyone else. It's like, it's like I didn't, I was interested in that, that almost suicidal urge that he has going on. It's like, I think it's because, like, at some level, although he doesn't remember Missy, he remembers not wanting to be her. So it's like, he just wants to die before she can happen, but he's going to be trapped and he is going to be her one day. And let, let's get Elaine's opinion on this one as well. well. I think, I think I kind of, I, I think it's definitely, I think like, if it's going to be anywhere, I would say like, after John Sim, before Missy, Missy's character, because like, I guess that would make a good kind of, like, plot device and whatnot, like, I feel like that would be a good thing too, but I'm not completely certain about it, because it's not true, I never really know what they're going to end up doing. <laughs> Uh, certainly. Um, and uh, the other part is there, uh, with Missy's, one of her first episodes had her controlling the Cybermen. So, and I'm wondering if this dates back to Sasha Dwan's version of the Master, where he actually did an alliance with the Cybermen and convert, you know, is this... Yeah, I, was a bit, I was a bit sad that he killed off um, a shard so easily, because like, he had been built up as like this big threat, and then the Master kills him, and then it's like, damn, I missed a good joke there. Mm. Mm. Certainly. <laughs> so what what next can we roll on our other parts from the timeless uh, from the timeless children? Um, do you think uh, what was it? What what are they, was it? It is Graham, Ryan, and Yes. Do you think they are due to? Do you think they will appear in the Revolution of the Daleks? I do now. Like I was theorizing that they were all going to leave, but um, like given. The way the note it's left on, I'm pretty sure it's like, yeah, they're, they're probably going to be in the special. Also, like, someone has, like, took photos of them 
during the filming with John Barrowman, so he's probably going to be there too. Yes, <laughs> well, maybe we could try and pop, prod and poke um, mm -hmm. at a later stage to find out that particular one. Uh, opinions from, uh, was it? We'll start off with William. I, I noticed something the other day that the case is going on a, a bit of a hiatus. So if that's the case, that would give uh, uh, Bradley Walsh a little bit of time to, uh, you know, to stay with Doctor Who. And considering he had a, a reality show, or kind of a travel show with his son that he got injured on recently, <laughs> I might think that he might just kind of step back and, and maybe just do Doctor Who for a little bit longer because there probably is an e easier shooting schedule. Uh, and you'll have the time since you won't have to run back and forth to do the chase for a while. <laughs> yeah, so it's like Emmeline. Um, I, I think they'll stay just because I have seen a lot of um, news articles saying they might be leaving, but at the same time, I just didn't get that feeling, I guess. Like, I do feel like they might stick around for longer, and I don't know. I, I just, and I also like the companions, I think they're really good together, so I don't really want, yeah, I don't want them to leave too soon. <laughs> so you think they definitely all mix well together? Well, so yeah, I mean, I guess like the third, um, I feel like the big one for me is mostly having three companions, it's hard to share a decent amount of screen time for character building, but besides that, I do like each individual companion. And go ahead, William, because you're about to say something. Well, I was just going to say that uh, I kind of like the idea that they have three companions because then they don't have to focus so tightly on maybe just one companion or two companions that have an interaction with each other. And it gives them a little bit more freedom, uh, you know, to spread the story out a little bit more instead of making it, you know, for example, with, with Rose, when she's a companion, there are a lot of the... Uh, you know, ten doctor companions. He just had one, so it was a very focal point between the doctor and that one other person. Hmm. He has, uh, he has, he now has more people to bounce their ideas and pass off, off of, and kind of, and it makes it easier for her to kind of get off, get on with the center of the story, by, while the other companions kind of deal with the ancillary subplots and whatnot. So I kind of like that. It, going back to, you know, two or three, I've always preferred. Certainly. Um, anything you want to add before we take our first break? We've ever done in the show? They made the Morpheus Doctor's canon. <laughs> so I'm still laughing at that. Like, I, I'm, I'm deeply, deeply embraced. I mean, that whole moment where it's like, I'm going to break out of the Matrix with my own theme music and a whole lot of flashbacks. It's like, that moment was pure fan wank, but uh, I loved it. Like, And they put in the Morpheus Doctor's, which... Feels like a joke I would make on Twitter to as a shit post, like, but they actually did it, and I just, well done. Also, I still think Joe Martin might actually be a six B Doctor, like that is in no way contradicted by the revelations of this episode, and explains why her TARDIS is a police box. The alternative is that that TARDIS has been the Doctor's for a lot longer than we think, and in fact, whenever they get their memories wiped by the Time Lords, they pick it up again, and it turns itself back into a police box. Is it just like <laughs> looking like that? Yeah, <laughs> sorry, yeah. That, that done. <laughs> Certainly. Okay, so now let's, uh, we'll do our first ever air break we've done for this season of 0800 TARDIS Live, and there's a few announcements coming up in that, so let's kick off the ads. Hey, um, <laughs> sorry, this is my fourth attempt at trying to make this video, a short video that's taken me forever. Um, okay, New Zealand, I am coming for you. I'm not even looking at the right place. Let me try that again. New Zealand, I am coming for you. Armageddon Expo, April 2020. I'm looking forward to meeting you all. Uh, be my first Comic Con as the master. Um, so yeah, be gentle with me. Uh, keep saying master. What do you prefer, master or the master? Master. See you then. Right, bye. <laughs> Marku42's Universe is the online radio show on Odyssey Radio. 
We cover Doctor Who and many other subjects now. You can listen to us at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and many other times throughout the week. Mark Who 42's Universe stars Mark Baumgart and his host and his co-hosts Ed and Patricia Fryer, Zion Kiros, and Iggy Matthews. Mark Who 42's Universe can be heard on iHeartRadio, Odyssey1.com, the Odyssey app, and listen to us on demand on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and on all the other podcast platforms around the world. Mark Who 42's Universe, from the universe and beyond. Hey everybody, it's John Barrowman here and I am getting ready to come to New Zealand. My husband Scott and I are getting ready to fly on down there and we're going to see you at the Armageddon Expo and it is on April 10th through the 12th, Easter weekend. So do not miss us. Come and see us. Come and say hi to Scott. Come and say hi to me. Come and get some autographs. Come and get some photo ops. Come and have a lot of fun. Come and see the panel. I may be wearing something really fantastic or fabulous. Anyway, so I'm really looking forward to it. It's cold here in the UK at the moment, but I hope the weather's a lot better down in Wellington. And I can't wait because we're staying an extra week and we're gonna go see the sights. Lots of love, see you in New Zealand. So what did you think about the announcements coming up with Armageddon this year? So, let's start off with Carrick. You're in New Zealand? Am I? Well, I assume so. You're in Wellington, so yes. Um, when is Armageddon? Exactly? Easter weekend. Oh, um... I, I'm... I, I'm glad Sasha Tomani and Katie Manning are going to be there. Like, uh, I mean, John Barrowman's used for it comms because it means the queues for everyone else's autograph are much shorter. Um, <laughs> That's according to my friend Kevin, at any rate. Uh, he, uh, I, I'm sorry, I was, um, he's a friend of mine. I was with him at Galley just, um, uh, just um, earlier this last month, early last month. So, like, <laughs> and, and Elaine would like to know: Is your passport up to date? And are you keen to book some cheap New Zealand flights to get to Wellington? <laughs> I don't even have a passport. Just oh, okay. don't fly Qantas yeah, if you're going trans Tasmanic. And also make sure you've got, uh, was it one of your parents' birth certificate as well? Because I heard Australia are an absolute pain in the butts trying to give passports to their citizens now. Really? Yeah, yeah. Aaron, uh, was it one of our, our graphics designers had that issue um, quite a while ago where he had to actually get either mum or dad's birth certificate as well as his own to actually apply for an Australian passport, which I thought was quite extreme considering um, he was born in the country and so were both his parents. Oh. Please throw Scott Morrison into the fire. Like, that might help. Oh, I want him in a fire. <laughs> Certainly. And uh, William, um, would you definitely sit there and say that would definitely be something you'd love to achieve to get to, but not sure how, coming from LA. Well, if I had a TARDIS, I'd, I'd, I'd be over there in a minute. <laughs> so, I mean, with conventions, you kind of need a TARDIS just to attend everything you want. I had to make some horrible sacrifices at Galley. <laughs> oh, I ha I've had to do that with Army Geeson up in Auckland as well. I mean, he choice from John Barrowman and Rick Sephos, and it's like, oh, what the hell did they have to sit there and do that? It's like a choice between Salute to Terrence Dix or Sarah Jane Adventures. I went to Sarah Jane, my friends went to Terence Dix. I got some amazing stories about drunk Daniel Anthony. <laughs> oh, that would be quite funny hearing. So, now, well, let's wrap up across the whole season of uh, Doctor Who for season 12. What would you gain your opinions? Do you believe that there are, have all the questions been answered? Or have we all really been left like, we now want to know when the next season is, but we, because we still got all these questions from this one. Who wants to jump in first? Okay, fine. Uh, I'll st I'll st I, I kind of, I kind of thought that uh, um, that this season is definitely better than the previous one. 
uh, they've settled into it. And uh, I'm actually kind of back to looking forward to watching Doctor Who. Um, I was a big Peter Capaldi fan, but I really couldn't stand Jenna Coleman. So I had Aww. mixed feelings about that. And this first season of uh, Jody Whitaker's, I, I felt the writing wasn't so great, but I feel like this year the writing has just been spectacular and much better. And um, the amount of money that you're spending on sets and, and special effects is, is really impressive. And Elaine, what do you sit there and think about this season? Um, I do definitely think it was better than the last season. Not that the last season was terrible or anything. It just felt, I got, like, as I said, I do love all the characters individually, but it did get at times a bit hard for me to watch. Like, some of the acting felt awkward to me. It wasn't anything, you know, bad. It was just, like, felt a bit off to me. But I feel like this season is very much, I feel like the writing is better and they're very much so got the chemistry and whatnot so i feel like it's been a good season and I, i'm kind of looking forward to what's going to come from you know all the questions left not answered from this season and carrot um since you're about to jump in right at the end it's definitely the strongest season of the chibnall era uh sorry that that turned to fake i mean last season was um infuriating and in how unambitious it was this season was certainly more ambitious um, I'd say the only real weak spots, I mean, at least at episodic level, were like um, the second half of Spyfall, which uh, had some uh, not good moments in it, and um, Orphan 55, which while I did like at least the writing and acting, it did have some um, bad direction and editing, like really bad. It was actually kind of amazing how bad it was. But the run of episodes from Nikola Tesla through to the finale is like, probably the best in years like i wouldn't say i like this as much as say season 10 at least overall but um yeah i'd say like basis but on the episode so basis it's probably stronger i still wish we could do a bit, a bit more with the companions than we are like the only episode this year that seems to have really done anything was can you hear me um as for unanswered questions, I think, um, I don't think they're going to follow up on this as much as we might think. Like, there's a scene in the finale with, um, Joe Martin's Doctor, which I think people might overlook, but it's actually very important. It's when she asks, so, uh, what, was I you? Did they erase my memories of you? And she goes, does it matter? And it's like, so we're not, still not really clear what she is, and I think... It's similar to what Moffat was doing. It's the Doctor isn't just a person. The Doctor is an idea. It's like the Doctor gets over her revelations in this episode. By, it's by, um, I'm still the Doctor, whatever else I might be. That's who I choose to be, regardless of where I come from. I felt like that, that was like the big ca character statement that it was doing, at least for this Doctor this season. So um, I'm not really, sh I have not the faintest clue what the next season is going to do. Like, at all. Um, it's it's going to be I a bit of a mystery. I suspect I'll know more come the special, which appears to be set in Sharda. I mean, it, it probably isn't, but it'd be hilarious if it is. Um, I don't know how many of the companions will be staying past the special. Um, so yeah, I'm very... I am curious to know what the hell is going to happen next year, because I legitimately have no clue. <laughs> And the other one, other part that's a bit interesting is, do we feel that the character Graham went from I'm just the bus driver and I swear Bradley Walsh was actually playing down a more dumbed down version of his usual self to now he, he's one who's adventurous, open, um, likes to use his smarts and all that sort of thing and is like, you know, doesn't play a dopey old bus driver. <laughs> I think a problem with Graham's character is that his art kind of ended last season and not much more was done with it. Like, it did touch on things with, like, he's still afraid that his cancer might come back. And it's like, there's a lovely scene with Yaz in this episode, but, um, most of him in the season has just been him having lots of cutesy lines. It's like, it feels like his character is completed and he's just kind of still here. So, yeah. Uh, what, what, what do you think about your guys' opinions? Well, I kind of think with uh, Bradley Walsh, it's kind of been a trend when there's multiple companions that not two. One of them just spills off, whether it's the fifth doctor or the first doctor. 
you know, um, I think that might be what he's building up to, and that, you know, that will probably happen sometime next season as a, as a catalyst for Ryan to either step up more or maybe even leave the, leave the show as well. But I, I kind of think they're going to kill off Graham at some point. And go alone, since you you're, you're haven't had your turn yet. <laughs> Um, I mean, I guess I do like him. I do, I guess, like, you know, people are like that in real life when they get opened up. They can be really ambitious and adventurous and whatnot, but it did still feel like a bit of a, I guess, quick transition from, you know, the two extremes. And at the same time, I guess, I do very much feel the same way that they've kind of finished his story up, and I don't really know what else they're going to do with him. So it'll be interesting what they end up doing. And one thing, since you're Australian, you'll be you you'll see this person on TV all the time. Do you think Andrew O'Keefe could sit there and uh, replace Bradley Welsh as Graham? <laughs> no. Uh, and for Carrick, who's a little bit confused, it's the guy who does Deal or No Deal, and he's also the host of The Chase yeah. Australia. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that that was like explain why you know. I mean, you know, that's something you can relate to, Elaine, because you know that name is big in New Zealand and Australia, but it's not really his name's not really big worldwide. So all I know about game shows no. I learned from the episode Bad Wolf. <laughs> well, they did get Anne Robinson, the host of the Weakest Link, to actually do the the voice of the android. Yeah, that was fun. Pretty she's a Tory, but um, yeah. Oh. Oh, that's right. You can always have Cornelius Francis. She was the uh, Australian equivalent. She also played Morag on Home and Away. I know, I'm not up on the soaps. So I'm sorry. Oh, there, there's no harm in that sort of thing. Uh, <laughs> well, so they have a lot more actors that they can take from Hollyoaks and put them as companions and Doctor Who, considering that two out of the three of them come from a British soap. <laughs> That's Yasmin and um, Ryan, the characters. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we'll see. The interesting so... connection with Doctor Who is in the 50th anniversary of that show's producer, the big Doctor Who fan, and they introduced a whole family of characters that are still on the show, Keegan, Leela, and Leela's daughter, is Terry. So, there's, there's, there's a lot of cross-pollination. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, a lot of soap opera actors do end up in Doctor Who, like, um, I was watching like the interview. Bradley Welsh. The interview with um Pearl Mackey at Galley, it was delightful. Um but it's just like she mentioned that it's like it was only her second TV role after three hours filming for a very bad soap, which was ironically Doctors. Yeah. Well, I mean Gina mm. Coleman was Emmerdale. Yeah, did, yeah. wasn't the Vale Yard also in that? Uh, yeah, yeah, and also Fraser Hines did Emmerdale after Doctor Who. That was another one, and also like uh, Bradley Welsh, he was Coronation Street as Mike Baldwin's illegitimate son on the show when he, he played Danny Baldwin. So that was something that I, I mean, as the you know, my mum used to watch show. I mean, Mike Baldwin got killed off was it 10, 15 years ago? So you know, that's how long it's you know probably since I actually watched Coro. Is this what it feels like to be in a room with Doctor Who fans when you're not one? Well, you sit there and say Daniel, the one who's doing the producer. <laughs> No, no, I was like, I have not the faintest idea what any of you are talking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, we mean, you know, our producer's not even... Uh, no, and, yeah, you haven't even watched the show. No. <laughs> You're both missing nothing and a lot. Nothing and everything. That seems to be my thing tonight. Nothing and everything, I like that. So, what is it, a hashtag character but... <laughs> Or Or I had Retardus Live. So what episode, uh, what episode would you rate as the best episode, staying off your lane, for series 12? Ah, uh, hmm. That's a hard one. Um, I'd probably have to go with episode 12. I guess, I guess I like, I did like 5, 4, part 1. Um, not so much part 2. Um, just, you know, didn't really feel that much. Um, I did like the, um, I think it's the episode, I think it's, Nikola Tesla's one. I like that because I do have an interest in like the sciences as well, so it's quite interesting to see as well to go back there. And um, I did think the time with Charles was good. Children were good as well. 
And where would you rate the best episode of Caesar William? I, I really like the Tesla one. And even though it kind of messes with the previous head cannon, I did like the, uh, the Mary Shelley one as well. I, I think they had really, uh, really great direction in both of them, and they were really concise and in their storytelling, especially the Tesla one. And I like when they bring historical figures into Doctor Who. I, it, I, that's one of the things that I like about early Doctor Who. Certainly, and Carrot. Um, yeah, I'm gonna be very shallow. Like my top three for this season were um, like, uh, I mean, I've with a lot of people with Nicola Tesla. It was probably the one that succeeded best at what it was trying to do. It wasn't trying to do that much or reinvent the wheel, but it was like probably the like most solid. But my top three were um, Praxius because it was a nice big episode that managed to juggle all its elements well and it was also very very gay and so yeah i love that uh villa diodati for fairly obvious reasons despite the fact it kind of goes against the silver turk I'll, I'll find a way to explain that away it also goes against mary's story which i don't mind because mary's story wasn't that good uh, but my favorite is gotta be fugitive of the jadoon those because the sheer amount of curveballs it throws you but and also because ruth uh yeah, Joe Martin is going to be to this era what Michelle Gomez was to the Capaldi era. It's like, I just want more of her. I want more and more of her. She is amazing. It's, and it's like, since Fugitive had the most her, and also same director as Nicola Tesla's Night of Terror, which is one reason it was so slick, and also written by Vinay Patel, who wrote the best episode of last season, which was Demons, and who I saw at Galley, and he is charming, and also small and cute, and something. Anyway, um, so yeah, Fugitive, my personal favourite for this season. And I'll definitely join you on the Fugitive of the Jado because I believe that was one of the, um, it, it yeah, as, as you said earlier, it froze all the curveballs, but it was the, epi it was the episode that wanted you to know more. Well, I think that was the one where we did the questions of the day. I don't think we used Radio Times one. I think we had our own because there were so many of our own that needed to be answered. I can't remember. Were you here for Vegetable of the June? Or... I hope so. Um, I, th I think I sent in a pre tape but I know I don't think I could. I, I think I was aware yeah, of that. Cause yeah, because I can't remember who was on the, um, that particular one. Because uh, I know it wasn't who had her because I know she came in at uh, Plexius. <laughs> Yeah, all, all the various different uh, guests we've had on the show. And what sort of things do you think will happen for um, season uh, for the Revelation of the Daleks, which is the... Revelation is a 1980s episode starring Colin oh, Baker. Oh, sorry. Revelation. Revolution! I feel like the title is a jokey reference towards all those like big 70s, like... Resurrection of the Daleks, Revelation of the Daleks, Remembrance of the Daleks. So, so you can... I'm surprised last year we didn't have Resolution of the Daleks. <laughs> because it was only one Dalek, so they couldn't call it that. But, um, um, yeah. Do you think this could be another comeback for Davros? Considering, you know... Well, he was fine last we saw him. Like, yeah, he was in a city which was, like, being destroyed. But, I mean, that's nothing compared to some of the stuff he's had to live through. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is so like, true. Like, maybe Davros will be back. I kind of don't care. Um, so sorry, guys. It's like, uh, like, Davros was... has always been kind of a fun character to be sometimes. I always feel like his existence kind of undermines the Daleks. It's like a inevitable result of fascism if you just blame it all on this one evil guy <laughs> but um like if julian what's his face is julian gonna... Ble bleach, bleach. Yeah. yeah he's been in a torture with sarah jane as well but um if he's gonna do it again okay fine he's a great vaudevillian actor so he's Mm. Yeah. I mean, all Terry. Well, no, actually, no. Terry Malloy is a bit old for them. Yeah, Plus, he still plays him on audio though, and he's amazing. Yeah, no, because he he really but, brought that. Yeah, if you get one audio with Davros on it, get the one that's well, it's just called Davros. It's by Lance Parkin. The Daleks aren't in it. It's all about the Doctor and Davros, and it's brilliant. It's about. It's also kind of about how fascism will kept call how will collaborate with capitalism but inevitably destroy it for its own ends with a fucking nuclear bomb <laughs> yeah, yeah that happens it's amazing I, I, sorry I, uh, yeah. yes i know we need to get a square jar yeah yes uh and, and from uh was it should we go with william or uh, who might go first go ahead um well i'm gonna go with um Tesla. <laughs> 
too sure what will happen. Like, I'm just hoping, you know, if, um, I guess, like, I'm kind of, I'm really curious because I did really get left a bit, um, like, gobsmacked at the last episode. There were so many things that were, like, really hard to take in. I just hope that they execute it well, you know, and finish it off. That's all I'm really hoping for, but I don't really have any theories on what's going to happen, though. Me neither. I think, I think Devros is going to return and he's going to gene splice the Daleks with Time Lord DNA and they're, now we're going to have Cybermen and Daleks both running around Dr. Who Universe with, with, okay. with Time Lord DNA and Osmond. And they also have capes. Like Daleks. <laughs> Daleks. Oh, Daleks, you know, on the back to cover, uh, you know, to cover their hat opening points and stuff so people can't get at them. I wouldn't be surprised. Wouldn't be surprised <laughs> if it went something and started to write up a Doctor Who episode. Alex and those guy collars. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure one of our fans is going to sit there and write one one of those up. Yeah, Ross is going to get one built into his chair, so it's like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, or, or what do you call Davros with Time Lord DNA that regenerates and suddenly has the bottom half of his body reappears and he can walk. <laughs> and now he's played by, I, I don't, don't know, I don't know, Harry Lloyd. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, someone who, someone, yeah, young, I don't know, could be going for all we know. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, we are, oh yes, you still, if you're going to even play a role in Doctor Who, it's going to be the Doctor, is it? No. Oh. Well, which one would it be then? If you if you could play a role of Doctor Who, you think I'm going to tell you? No, no, that's very true. Because otherwise, you probably you know sit there and do it. <laughs> okay, well, I think that we can call it for a wrap tonight. Um, yeah, yeah. Was it your last pieces you'd like to sit there and say, William? Well, I just think that uh, you know, so much with science fiction, whatever programs they put out, Everything is really fluid, and I think everybody can figure out how everything fits in uh, one way or another. So I don't think we have to really be, be so overly worried about continuity as story content and how all the stories are told. I mean, that's the reason people read books, is they pick up some books for stories, not continuity, you know. Um, and I think that's something that can be learned from this. And yourself alone. Ah, oh, I'm really, I'm just like, I guess I'm excited, you know, like, I feel like the writing has got a lot better as of late. Um, I feel like Jodie has definitely become very much a doctor. Like, when I watch her, I'm like, oh yeah, that's a doctor. And I do really like a doctor, I do see a lot of comments against her, but, um, I personally don't have a problem with her. I just really hope that they keep going with the story and don't do anything, I guess, don't play it too safe, like last season, I guess, in some ways, but, like, don't be too extreme with what you do, because I think they're doing well now with what they're doing. And yourself, Kara? Uh, I think I've seen a lot. Um, <laughs> You've seen a lot? <laughs> Like, I mean, yeah, same. I thought the season was better. I hope it goes on. I, my only real issue with Jodie Whittaker's Doctor is that she seems to be more written as a generic idea of the Doctor than as her own character a lot of the time. Like, I can infer ideas of what her character is, but a lot of it seems to just, like, be applicability rather than deliberate. Which is why it's weird to contrast her with Joe Martin's Doctor, who is very much written as her own character, who happens to be the Doctor. Like, you know. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> oh, that's I have too much to say. Well, <laughs> it's all good. Okay, well, thank you for joining us, Elaine, William, and Carrick, for this episode of 0800 TARDIS. Uh, I wish I could sit there and put my hand down the camera to shake, but it's a little bit difficult considering we're all different parts of the world and we're even in different time zones and different parts of the day, which, you know, I think the clock will be ticking midnight over in um, Burbank soon. Yeah, well. Yes, well, okay, so we'll just sit there and get back onto me, and uh, thanks for watching the latest round of 0800 TARDIS Live. We will be working to see what else can we keep doing while we're in that void of no Doctor Who. Listen to Big Finish and read a whole bunch of books. Yes. 
carrots got, got it there. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, you can keep following up with Mark Who 42 uh, podcast. They're going to be continuing throughout there as Marcus sat there and said. And we do have an apology from Simon Fisher Becker. He was meant to make it tonight, but we have not been able to get hold of him. We will try to schedule him at a later date in the future with something that's a bit more time friendly for his particular one. So us here from the 0800 TARDIS team would like to wish you a good good night and good season. And thank you for following us throughout this season. Thank <laughs> you.